Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And today on Wandering DMs, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs in D&D. Are they a good fit for Dungeons & Dragons, or are they just too big for your fantasy world? All that and more today on Wandering DMs. You know, a uh, big thanks to our viewer, William Heilman, for this idea. And it's one of those ideas that I was super thrilled about as soon as uh, he pitched it. And I was like, why didn't I think of that? It's so it's so close to me. I, I needed somebody else to point that out. So thanks to William. Excellent, excellent. That's um, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, Dan. I think um, you know, you're asking how we should how we should come come at this. Um, you know, there's there's printed material that features dinosaurs in, historically in D and D. Um, I think probably the first time I saw them was the the Monster Manual, right? That's yeah, right. The, the totally. first place I encountered it. Um, do Do you know where they first appear? Like, what is the first uh, appearance of dinosaurs in? Yeah, in the you know, they, they, dinosaurs have been part of Dungeons and Dragons from the very from the very inception. They've always been there. So even in the little brown books, um, if you look in the right place, uh, you're absolutely going to see dinosaurs in the 1974 edition of D and D. I have. Um, particularly in the encounter tables. I have an image there of like uh, three encounter tables there um, out of uh, volume three in the uh, little brown books. I don't know if you can pull that up on screen. Um, uh, okay, give me a second here. I'll get that up. Um. <laughs> now, as, as Paul pulls this up, one, you know, we're going to be looking at uh, an encounter table in original D&D here in a second. And... Uh, one of the is it this one by terrain type? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's exactly it, right? So you yeah. have um, you know your normal encounter tables are uh, by terrain type, by you know forests and woods and river and mountains and stuff like that. And then right at the end, you have these three optional tables, and you have an op. The very first uh, column there is an optional Jurassic type swamp that lists a Tyrannosaurus rex and a pterodactyl and a Triceratops and Brontosaurus and Stegosaurus and stuff like that. And then, it, you know, and then other columns there that we won't talk about today, uh, you've got a Burroughs Martian uh, optional arid plains that clearly comes out of the John Carter Mars books, right? Uh, Barsoom with the uh, apps and bants and white apes and things like that. And then you have uh, the third column there is clearly an Ice Age optional mountains uh, uh, idealist with cave bears and dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers and stuff like that. Now, the interesting thing with all this stuff is that original D&D, you know, has these encounter tables and they list real world animals and they list dinosaurs and stuff like that. And they don't give any stats for any of them. N none huh. of them are given any st stat blocks, right? It's, it, we're, at a, we're, at, we're at a stage where, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so sketchy and it's so um, improvised that of course the DM just needs to make up stats by fiat on the fly for all of these things. Um, so the, the DM is very much kind of um, on their own about actually filling in what any of these things um, do. And the, the only place, the only other place that there's any suggestion of that, um, and I think in that same folder with Paul, there's, a, there's another black and white image mm -hmm. with some text from od and from this book right here. Uh, so, they, so there's a couple places where they just give a couple ideas. Under sea monsters, it says uh, maybe you should look at a book on prehistoric life forms. Uh, maybe something like this that you could have in the 70s, right? And get some ideas for real world, um, real world uh, monsters from that. And then there's this block on just large insects or animals, and it says this category includes giant ants and prehistoric monsters. And the armor class can be this to this. And the hit dice should range from two to anywhere up to twenty. Let us say for a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and that's all you get. So yeah. uh, we agree that a Tyrannosaurus is the biggest of all animals, right? The most ferocious of all animals you're ever going to see in D and D. And other than that, you're on your own DMs. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. You know, I always, <laughs> I always wondered. You know, a couple of weeks ago we did um, we did a show on giants, and. Um, it was kind of pointed out that like possibly that was the easiest um, miniature when in the in the wargaming roots of D anD D when you first want to introduce fantasy, it's possibly the easiest miniature to procure, right? Because it's just a, a normal person on a different scale. And, <laughs> uh, and as I wonder, like, did we get dinosaurs also because they're like, well, yeah, there's toy dinosaurs, like those have been around for forever, so let's just grab our, you know, 
boy. Yeah, there you go. Chuck them on the table next to the miniatures, and eh, pretty good. Pretty good. You gotta you gotta <laughs> base them. You gotta base them in scale with your other miniatures. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> Did they worry about that? Did they worry about that? I don't know. <laughs> well, they should have. They should have because <laughs> somebody they should be measuring exact anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Comparing to your D and D miniature, make sure that it's yeah, that's about yeah. right. Yeah, that's good. That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. But on the other <laughs> hand, like we already have weird, fantastic interpretations of these monsters, right? I mean, surely, how different yes. is a you know is a dinosaur from a dragon, right? How you know when you have stuff like uh, I don't know, you know, wyverns and griffins and mm-hmm. I, mean, I think I'm that's a real. Of, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I think that's a real question about when you know when you include dinosaurs in your game. Is is it trotting upon mental space that's already taken up by these medieval fantasy monsters, like exactly what you just said, Paul, like hydras and dragons and wyverns and stuff like that? Is there a place in the campaign for both, or is it stealing? Is it is are your thunder lizards stealing the thunder of other monsters? Um, now, uh, obviously, you know what what D anD D tends to do, and, and like you see in that original D&D table there is here's an optional planes list, maybe for some special location, is that basically, you know, every D&D, every major D&D setting product, they've all had a uh, dangerous wilderness, jungle, tropical Southlands Mm -hmm. um, that has barbarians and maybe undead. and, And that's the place where you can have dinosaurs. And in, in Greyhawk, you have that in the, like they have Monoland, is a good place for that. In uh, the Forgotten Realms, you've got Chult. And in um, the uh, known world of Mystera, you've got the Isle of Dread. And for many of us, that might have been the first place that we actually played with dinosaurs is with the Isle of Dread module, where you have to take a, take a slow boat from the settled lands far across the sea to the south uh, on, a, on a mission you know, for you know, lost treasure. And the island is, of course, infested with a whole bunch of dinosaurs. So for a lot of us, that's the first place that... Um, and, of course, that was the adventure that was uh, came in the box for the D&D <laughs> right. expert set. And yep. we didn't... At, there was a particular moment for all of us where at fourth level, we didn't have anything to do except go to the Isle of Dread and fight the dinosaurs. Have you run Isle of Dread, Dan? I definitely have. Yeah, I definitely, uh, I definitely run that. Uh, had a great time with it. Uh, I think many of us love it. You know, the denouement is a little weak. The Isle of Dread, you fight through an island of monster, you know, huge dinosaurs. You get to a lost plateau in the center. You fight your way over a giant, uh, uh, enormously tall uh, volcanic uh, uh, eruption site. And then there's like a very small two-level dungeon with a fairly small amount of treasure in the middle of it. So um, some people take other modules and they slap it into the center as like the ending point, which is a pretty smart idea. Is I feel like the um, the conclusion of it probably should be a little bit more epic scale because as is, it's a little thin at the end. Mm-hmm. But the dinosaurs are great. Yeah. <laughs> So that's yeah, what I, that's, like I think I, that's what most D and D settings to do is they tend to put it on the corner of the map and say if you want to go deal with dinosaurs you're going to go into this foreign location it's not part of your main campaign world. Right, right. I mean that's 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 how I've used them um, in my own campaign. Um, like the one time I I I, I dredged them out was um, I had a a D and D campaign that ran for a long time where one of the major party-driven goals was to find magic that would restore lost limbs. Um, Because, of course, I play with a horrific uh, critical hit table that would uh, take limbs off, and there's, by default, no magic that does that. Um, Which is not totally true, right? You've got uh, maybe a ring of regeneration might help. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So I dropped one of those in the campaign world somewhere. Um, I think I had another hook with uh, involving the plated mage in Stonehell. but eventually, the funny thing is, my party, my players kept pursuing one of these hooks, and then and then kind of chickening out and saying like, "Well, that's this is this is too dangerous. This is too scary. We'll go we'll go find something else." So I kept having to reinvent new 
new things to drop <laughs> in the world that mean my score lost limbs. So I came up with some myth of um, of the, the 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 source of all magic being this tree of life that uh, had grew magical fruit that could heal all wounds. Um, but the thing is, it couldn't be transported, so you had to go and find this thing, this sort of like you know origin point of of the known world. And and I put it up on a plateau and I filled it with um, like you know large prehistoric or versions of of what was in the world, right? And so I had like you know cave elves instead of cavemen um, and <laughs> stuff like that. Um, I think the, the thing I was most proud of, I think, with that was um, they had to in order to get up onto this plateau that's way up in the sky, they have to go through a cave system and climb up. And it's infested with purple worms, which is a hint that like everything's going to be huge, right? <laughs> when you get up there, you know <laughs> there are giant birds that are eating the giant purple worms, which are like normal worms for them, right? So everything was just ridiculous and oversized uh, up there. Awesome. Um, yeah, and so we had some dinosaurs and such. It's, it's, uh, good fun, good fun. But again, it was like off to the side. It was a, it was a specifically they wanted to get up there go find the tree of life get the fruit get the hell out um yeah so it was a little like you know it's you know, funny. a little vacation from normal D D stuff it, it, it's funny because what what you're describing for your adventure kind of echoes you know the fifth edition uh tomb of annihilation setup actually hmm. uh, it's set in the forgotten realms and again there's a problem with healing magic is to my understanding i haven't played yeah. through that, but my understanding is the initial pitch is uh, people who have been raised from the dead are suddenly diseased and falling sick and dying. And the only place that you can fix that is to go into Chelt, fight your way through the dinosaur-ridden jungle, and then get to a tomb where the ultimate magic is, is lying. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a solid, it's a solid concept for that kind of yeah. fundamental thing to be put in a fundamental place, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Um, Me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw up a, a, a comment from. All right, it it is the one that my players oh, actually followed team. through on. So that was fun. I got to got to play with it. Sorry, what, what, what are you trying to say, Dan? Uh, so so um, we were uh, a couple minutes ago. We were thinking uh, like where you know where is a good place to put dinosaurs so that your players have a like oh this is different. And it's not just a mishmash with all your dragons and wyverns and so forth. And so um, Hobo Ogre here had a pretty good uh, comment. And, and he's not alone in saying this, uh, saying, my impression was that dinosaurs were included for adventuring in Lost Lands settings, like the Isle of the Dread and uh, Land of the Lost. And of course, usually whenever this, and, and you're right, Hobo Ogre, of course, whenever this topic comes up, you're going to wind up, at some point, someone's going to use the phrase Lost World, right? So a lot of this comes from, uh, you know, the Arthur Conan Doyle pulp book, uh, a little bit over 100 years ago now, The Lost World. And it's an obvious idea. If you know that there are dinosaurs, then obviously the immediate question mark is what would it be like if people interacted with them? So you get The Lost World, you get movies based on that. King Kong is, you know, uh, largely set in that kind of world. The Jurassic Park movies are making billions of dollars. Um, and so I think that, you know, as soon as anybody, any, anybody as a young person was thrilled seeing that on screen or in a pulp literary book, you, you definitely want that in your D&D game. Hmm. I mean, I guess we haven't really talked about it, but isn't, um, isn't there a solo adventure about, uh, Island of Apes or something that's kind of, uh, King Kong-esque? Well, uh, so, you know, to, all of this stuff is basically King Kong-esque to some extent. Really, if you look at, uh, you know, Isle of the, the Dr Isle of Dread, um, yeah. you know, the, it, it's a, the, there's a, there's one peninsula of the island that has natives on it, that has a giant wall that they've built in order to keep the dangerous things away, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, in the first edition DM's guide, even, uh, Gygax writes, you know, I had a level in the Greyhawk dungeon that would transport people to the Isle of King Kong with dinosaurs hmm. and stuff. And so later on, you're right, of course, later on, uh, there's the WG6 adventure, Isle of the Ape. Uh, it's not a solo module, 
But same thing. It's totally based on the King Kong idiom. Uh, you, again, you have a peninsula. You've got a bunch of natives on it. They have a giant wall. Uh, and sure enough, there is, you know, there's a series of, uh, there's actually more than one gargantuan ape on the island that you have to go and track down in order to return to your normal world. Did I, uh, you know, use my, my childhood uh, dinosaur models and scale them to D&D and then set up in my, you know, my apartment in Boston at the time and get a miniature uh, to represent uh, King Kong in scale for D&D <laughs> miniature. Yes, I did. I did, in fact, do that, Paul. And, um, and we, had a pretty good time. we had a pretty good time with that. So it took a couple weeks to uh, play through that and uh, resulted in a TPK. Yes, everybody yeah, died yeah. or was driven insane <laughs> on the Isle of the Ape when we played through it a number of years ago. I think you were part – I mean, that was long ago enough, Paul, that you might be hazy. I think that you played through on that, I think. I, I don't think I, I was crazy? present for that one. I, I remember it happening, but I don't think I was there. Yeah. You know what? You're, you're right, because actually, now, now that you mentioned it, you were helping me design battle maps. There were a couple, there there were a couple of situations where you were helping me design battle maps um, mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. You're right. So you were, you were background yeah. co-DM. I think um, – you know, I think uh, Ho Ogre here makes a, a an excellent point of um, you know that that uh, that the uh, that in a, in a fantasy world with uh, I'm just going to read what he's wrote here. Even in a world of dragons, hydras, and griffins, dinosaurs tell the players we're not in Kansas anymore. Right? It is a definite switch yeah. you can throw to say this is this is not this is not what you're used to. You're you've gone someplace weird. Right, which is which is strange because, of course, the default setting of D and D is someplace weird. So, uh, you really have to do something unusual, I think, to give that impression of now your now your characters are someplace even more unusual. Um, yeah. yeah, and there's definitely which desires, I, which I like. you know, repeated desire in D and D books to do that. Right, like this is how you get all the like alternate world gates because we're going to send the players to you know, the Wild West or, you know, modern day, you know, yeah. whatever, what, or whatever other uh, setting, you know, game that they're selling these days. Yeah, yeah, totally. I'm just going to pitch up a, a comment from uh, Joshua here, just, which is probably the, 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 the final thing on like the literary history. So, so Joshua is asking, is Journey to the Center of the Earth the earliest uh, of these stories where humans meet dinosaurs in some place they're survived. I, and I agree with Joshua. I think that when I, when I do my lit search, <laughs> uh, that, that is the earliest um, uh, example of that, that Jules Verne writing during the Central Earth, I think around 1850, something like that. Um, so I, I think I agree with uh, Joshua about that. That's the earliest one that I know of. You're right. So maybe we should get into like, does Fern get a credit? Like, like in, uh, does, does Fern get a call out in, in, in Appendix N for this? Pretty sure not. Oh, that's good. Pretty okay. sure not. Most, most everyone in Appendix N are, are pulp writers from the 20s yeah. to 50s or so, mostly. So no, Vern got stuck. I think later on, like Gygax had like a well, I you know, I didn't even include anything that's in the science fiction category in that list and then there's a place online where he's like oh here's a whole lot of science fiction authors that i've read and this and this and this and this and Vern might have been in that one possibly okay good question yeah. hmm. all right so let's talk about maybe like problems like things you want to watch out for if you're going to start if you're going to throw your players into a lost world situation and you want dinosaurs you want them confronting dinosaurs in your game um, and you know, there's a you know, based on this, the the sketchy OD and D status, different editions treated them possibly in, in different ways. The first one that a couple people you know start asking about, and I had one or two people ask this to me on Twitter actually, is should you use like the scientific names? Like right now, I think we're looking at a Brontosaurus from the first mm -hmm. edition Monster Manual. Should you use the 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 real world names of Brontosaurus and Tyrannosaurus Rex and Triceratops and Dimitrodon, or should you use uh, you know made up fantasy world what medieval people would call them before the scientific era, and uh, in particular the 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 fourth edition game D and D fourth edition went in that latter direction as they made up different names for them. They didn't call them dinosaurs; they called them behemoths, and the individual. 
um, dinosaurs were called a mace tail or a blood spike or a claw foot or something like that instead of you know what you and I would normally name these dinosaurs here. Uh, how do you feel about that? Other editions all use the normal names. They call them dinosaurs. They use the normal names that we're familiar with. How do you? How does that hit you, Paul? Which one? Which approach feels better to oh, you? I don't know. I mean, it depends on who your target audience is, right? Because if it's if we're talking about like you're listing stuff in the monster manual and the target audience is clearly the, the DM, then by all hmm. means, I would use the scientific names, right? Just just you know. To make make it obvious, we know we know what we're talking about. Like then, it's up to the DM if they right. want in fiction of their their worlds to, to rename them. Um, I don't think I would bother with that. Uh, and I, but I guess it depends on like how you know who who's saying these names out loud, right? Like what's <laughs> if they're in a lost world? Who's who knows that they exist? Did medieval people have a concept of dinosaurs? Um, you know, it's my recollection that, you know, earlier I mentioned um, uh, I was comparing dinosaurs to fantastic monsters, and I, I mentioned the uh, griffin because that always pops out of my head is I believe the story is that the griff, the origin of the griffin may be uh, triceratops bones, right? Is, is ancient people trying to explain triceratops fossils. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my understanding too. Is it, or, or, or they would just call them dragons? They would go. Clearly, there are dragons in the world because here's a giant thigh bone. That's a dragon. That's that's kind of maybe I might be totally off base on that, but that's actually my broad understanding. Is that the the scientific classification of dinosaurs being, you know, descended from reptiles of some sort, uh, and being able to scientifically classify them didn't come up until like the 1800s or so when you know when Jules Verne started writing. Um, so yeah, I think that they would call them dragons, to my understanding, or something like that. Now it's interesting because, of course, you know, pulp literature can flip it in the other direction. Because, uh, like, if you look at the first edition Monster Manual, of course, they use the normal terms for um, dinosaurs. But then Gygax actually flips it around, and he also starts giving scientific names for dragons, right? So if in the, in, in the dragon pages, right. You've got a white dragon, and then in parentheses it says Draco Rigidus Frigidus, right? And then and then your your red, your red dragon, right? Okay, red dragon, but then it says Draco Conflagratio Horribilis is 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 your scientific nomenclature for it. And then um, actually, uh, I, I recall T. H. White in the Once and Future King. He actually gives a scientific name it's because you just mentioned griffins. And mm -hmm. uh, T.H. White calls the griffin. Oh, it's really Falco Leona Serpentis is the scientific thing. <laughs> so it, it's funny that in the, 19, in the 1900s, it comes back around the other way. Maybe the fantasy things really should have had scientific names that you didn't know about before. <laughs> right. right. Draco Rigidus Frigidus. <laughs> <laughs> I, want, I want to hear from someone who's actually used the dragon scientific names in some way in their in their D and D campaign. Who's, how does that come up? That seems a little odd. Probably a sage writing someplace. I don't know, but I, I agree with your point about in, if you're going to put them in the monster manual where the where the DMs reading them, you probably ought to use the normal names. And I saw uh, fourth edition players on a forum. Uh, complaining about that, that as a DM, they they actually couldn't find him in the book, right? They, I was like, where are dinosaurs? I'm looking under D. Where are they? And someone asked, well, no, they're listed under behemoths. Like, oh, I didn't remember. I got to remember that. Um, so it actually turned into a you know discovery search indexing problem mm -hmm. in fourth edition because uh, the DM couldn't quickly remember the the new thing they'd come up with. I mean, I have to say, I do. You know, if you're if you're playing into the trope of uh, the dragons are in some kind of lost world, um, and that maybe there are some natives in that lost world who have built a giant wall, because I guess that's the trope. Um, I do enjoy the fiction of having a standard D and D party go out there and maybe have a little miscommunication with them saying, "Oh yeah, oh, yeah they're a dragon. Oh, they're a lot. You know, we built these walls to keep out the dragons." Okay. And then yeah, them yeah, being yeah. like, "Will those dragons fly?" No, no. Wait, what do you mean? I mean, there's all kinds of different dragons, right? And then just have this weird... I would enjoy role-playing out, I think, that miscommunication of, like, oh, our dragons are not like your dragons. 
<laughs> See, it goes in both directions. It goes in both directions. Now, now, the other thing is like Jerry actually has a good idea that I wouldn't. Um, uh, so Jerry McDonald here is also pitching the idea that, well, you could take the, the scientific name and then just translate it in English. For example, Brontosaurus, one of the earliest, uh, translates to Thunder Lizard, right? And Apatosaurus means Deceit Lizard. So you could possibly just directly translate them. That would have been really better fourth edition. Um, uh, so that's a possible idea. So I can see, you know, there's a, there's an argument on both sides of there's this mystery surprise element about exactly what we're dealing with. And I honestly like your take, Paul, of like, well, before we see them, give a little bit of miscommunication. But for my take, um, I think that once the players actually see them, I like the game to, you know, go pretty quickly. And I think that and I, and, I, and I usually feel that this is a strength of D&D when it connects to other things in the world. I think I would lean towards just telling my players it's a Tyrannosaurus, right? And they know what it looks like. They know how big it is and look what it looks like and how it eats and how dangerous it is. And they've seen people running in movies. And I think I would want to lean on that uh, shared yeah. knowledge uh, to make the, 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 um, the game move quickly. Now, an idea that, honestly, I wouldn't have had until you told me you know, in the in the past, Paul, because it's not actually my instinct is, you know, maybe the players are using the real name, but the characters are doing something else, right? Maybe the players know what this is, but we're going to pretend that our characters don't know what it is. That's a that's a legitimate way to play. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and I would even probably lean into that in the way that I describe it as DM talking to my players. Yeah, uh, I would say something like, "Okay, well, you see crashing out of the jungle what." What you, what everyone around this table, as players, know to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex, though, of course, your characters have never mm -hmm. seen anything mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. right. And then, yeah. yeah, then they give the, open the door for them to go role play the, what is this crazy wingless dragon coming at us? Exactly, exactly. The other thing that I've considered in the past is, like, just another take, is, uh, you know, get some, uh, get some dinosaur flashcards. <laughs> a prop like that, right? And you can say you can you can hold it up, and you can say uh, you see a, a huge, long-necked thunder lizard coming at you. Wink, wink. <laughs> right? So you could you could verbally say one thing, but then actually just show the players, and they'll recognize it and go, "Oh, I, I know what that is." Right? So you could you could communicate it like that. It's hmm? an idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then your players are going to be very disappointed that you don't have illustrated cards for every monster in the game. Where's where's the rest of my? Uh... Don't you, Paul? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> Don't we? <laughs> no, it's incomplete. It's incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, look for that on wandering DMs in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I, certainly in the book, in the book, you should you should just use the real world name, and you should you should not shy away from our shared knowledge of, of world building, uh, and and if you can communicate quickly with that, then you know at least at least index it in the book under the name that people know. I think that's the yeah, lesson we got from fourth edition. Yeah. Now you know many of us are excited about uh, you know. Like again, for me, I was like just like you, Paul. I was super excited when I got the the first edition monster manual. And there's there's a huge and here I am running in the dinosaur section, right? And um, you know, kind of an interesting take that Gygax has on it. There's a there's an introductory paragraph here that says because of the nature of time in planes where magic works, dinosaurs widely separate in time are discussed here under, for they can be found intermingled on some alternate world strange plane or isolated continent somewhere. Great detail will not be given to any one kind, but all major forms are depicted. I don't know if he got all of them, but he got, he got a lot of them. So when I, when I turned the monster man, I got great dinosaurs, and I'm a huge dinosaur fan as a, as a seven-year-old kid, and it goes on, and it, and it goes on, and it goes on. And so in, um, here we are ending with a Tyrannosaurus. And so in, in first edition, he's got fully six pages and like about 30, 30 different types of dinosaurs in there. And I was, I was so excited about that when I saw, oh my God, there's, there's dinosaurs in D&D. &D. Um, do you need that many? Do, do you really <laughs> need that many? Because, you know, other editions, right? Other editions have never given that, that many. Uh, second, third, fourth, fifth edition, they only usually have like about a half dozen, like maybe six or eight or nine at most. 
fourth edition only actually had two. Um, maybe that's enough. Maybe you only need like half a dozen to get the flavor across and maybe you can avoid. And then actually like in Isle of the Ape, Gygax went and he, and he added even more. Um, I don't know if you want to pull up the yellow roster from that's, that's actually from Isle of the Ape. Um, you know, one thing one thing that immediately jumps to my mind, though, here, Dan, is like what, um, like what, the thing in the movie Jurassic Park, right? How many mm -hmm. different yeah. types of dinosaurs appear in Jurassic Park? Uh, I bet it's half a dozen, right? And I think I that, that you know, this just you know, in 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 fiction, <laughs> there's only so much we can take in, right? And I think you would want yep. to. You know, over the course of however many sessions you're going to spend with dinosaurs running around terrorizing your D and D characters, you would want to hit on the classics that everyone at the table is going to recognize, right? You want your mm -hmm. Triceratops and your Tyrannosaurus and your Brontosaurus, and then, like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a couple other weird ones, maybe. But you're not gonna you're not gonna have thirty. Come on, thirty. <laughs> that's a that's a lot. I agree. I agree. Now, now I agree. Again, as a as a as a young OCD person, I wouldn't. I, I thought more was better all the time. Um, <laughs> and and at the moment, right, what we have on screen is we have from the Isle of the Ape Adventure by Gygax. We have on the, the back folder of the module. He's got a combined monster statistics chart, and I don't know how many things are there. Like about fifty or sixty or something like that. And they're almost all dinosaurs. And it goes on and on and on and on and on with the uh, the first edition. Uh, D and D uh, statistics for all the stuff in the monster manual. I think he was adding more stuff in there, more species of dinosaurs, and just goes on and on and on and on. And yeah, I think you know we remember the the uh, the rule of seven. The the rule of seven plus or minus two is about how many things people can remember in a particular category at once. And yeah, now I think and and look, let me let me let me tell you how how crazy I would get. I was talking with Nathan Foley uh, by, by email because he sent me a spreadsheet of uh, dinosaur statistics that he was working on in the past. And I said, oh, yeah, thank you for reminding me. Um, because in the third edition era, I went online, I downloaded a scientific list of dinosaur species that was, I think, like 850 dinosaurs long. And I was coming up with a system to convert from their length and their weight to D and D statistics, and I was like, I'm going to make a third edition product out of this. And then at some point, I was like, Do people need a thousand different dinosaurs? That might <laughs> that might possibly be excessive, Dan. I don't know if you agree with that, but I was like, eh, I don't know. If people are really going to be using a thousand different dinosaurs in their games. That might be too much. Interesting product, but yeah. Yep. So I yep. think that nowadays. I think that nowadays, I, you know, and this is actually not something that any edition of D&D has actually done. I think I would lean towards giving ranges for particular categories of dinosaurs, right? So if you can chop them up into like about five groups, you got, you got the theropods, right? Like Tyrannosaurus or Allosaurus or Gorgosaurus, right? So they, they walk on two, two legs and they, they, they're meat eaters and they hunt other dinosaurs, right? Those are theropods. And there's, some are smaller. Velociraptors, I think, are in that, that category. Much smaller. Utah raptors, about the size of a person, right? And then you have the sauropods, which are the giant, long-necked, you know, four-legged things like Brontosaurus and Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus and Apatosaurus, if that's still a thing, and Gigantosaurus and Titanosaurus, right? And they all be, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they basically all look the same, but some are like huge <laughs> and some are really, really huge and some are like mind-bogglingly, insanely huge, right? So I think that my take nowadays would be like, here's the basic stats for a theropod like a Tyrannosaur, and here's stats for a sauropod, and here's stats for an, an ornithopod, right? And here's stats for a cetosaur, right? You can say you can be from five hit dice up to 20 hit dice, and the damage is this range, and go to town. And here's, here's you know, list some examples so people know exactly what you're talking about. And you only really need about half a dozen different types. They don't have special abilities. They're not that different. And I think that that would cover a lot of space myself. I mean... One one could argue, Dan, that possibly uh, you could just write a short paragraph that says something like, uh, they should have anywhere from 2 to 20 hit dice. 
How about that? <laughs> it's a strong argument, Paul. I'm coming, I'm coming around to that now that you say that. <laughs> So it is interesting, right? So you come back to the you come back to the original D and D idiom of like here's some ranges and you're going to make it up on the fly and that's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, here is here are the specific Tyrannosaur stats from from first edition, um, and uh, you know, and and you can see you know marketing wise it's less to sell. So I can sort of see why the company wants to flesh out more stuff so you can buy it. I guess if you're, I guess if you're a nerdy dinosaur fan at age anywhere from seven to fifty-seven, um, you can, you you want you know you can show your mastery, right? All your great knowledge of dinosaurs of like, oh, do you have a do you have a Demetrodon? This is not technically a dinosaur, you know, but it should it should be in the game because it's it's an ancient reptile, right? So there's a certain you know mastery of showing offness that you know about this stuff that yeah. some of us. Kind of are a fan of, but I think that it takes up too probably takes up too much space in the in the first edition books. Hmm. What do, yeah. do you know what uh, what we have now in in fifth edition? Yeah, there are I think six. Uh, yep, there's there's six types, and they kind of hit the the big example, just like you're saying. I think it's got a tyrannosaur and a triceratops and a brontosaurus. I think, and probably one flyer and probably one sea monster. Yep, that makes sense. That's what I, I would want. Correctly. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. Does a pretty good job. That's that's pretty much exactly what you want. And they're called dinosaurs, and they have the the proper names and stuff like that. Uh, and I think it only takes two pages, right? It takes two pages in the fifth edition monster manual, if I recall correctly. And that's good. Mm -hmm. Good for them. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm curious if there are modern fifth edition. I'm sure there are. What what are the modern fifth edition uh, uh, content books that feature dinosaurs? They remake. Well, Tale of Dread. Yeah. To, well, to my understanding, uh, to my understanding, the main thing that you see them in is uh, Tomb of Annihilation. Um, and if you go for like fifth edition D and D dinosaur art, most of the art you see is going to be out of the Tomb of Annihilation uh, products. Again, set in the Chelt region on the outskirts of the Forgotten Realms. Um, and I'll say this, that actually, you know, that example <clears throat> brings up another issue. Um, and I think most of us are in the direction, I guess, intended, I guess, of we're probably going to have dinosaurs in a lost world offset location that the players have to travel to. But um, in fifth edition with Chult, they go in a different direction. <clears throat> and that is maybe you want dinosaurs like closely actually tied into your campaign setting. So in Chult, uh, that region, at least people know about dinosaurs. And they domesticate them. And so the whole culture, you're using dinosaurs, like instead of camels or beasts of burden, they're carrying things. People are riding dinosaurs. People are racing dinosaurs. Right? You're traveling through the jungle on a, on a, on a tame dinosaur. Um, and Very, I, I'm on the uh, fence about that. Is, that. is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. It's a very Dinotopia-esque sounds to me. Yeah, right. Um, I wonder if that's the inspiration for that. Um, uh, right. I don't know if you've seen those, those books, Dan, it's just, you know, illustrated books of, of, of that kind of thing of, of people domesticating dinosaurs, which is weird. I don't know. <laughs> or sorry, as Joshua points out, also as seen in the Flintstones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Also that. That's good. That's good. I, I guess so. Bill, I guess is pointing out they actually had like a dinosaur race scene in the adventure. I guess where people have to get on, get on your dinosaurs. Not your. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. I know. There's a big piece of artwork around that. I didn't. I didn't know the PCs actually did that. But yeah, that's amazing. Okay, For it's sure. not your dad's chariot racing. <laughs> your great 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 granddad's cherry racing. <laughs> and now I can see why you'd want to do I mean I can see someone saying like you know I, there are times when people say you know dragons are in the name of our game but you don't see a whole lot of dragons we should make them more central to the gameplay we should make a setting that's all dragons all the time everywhere everywhere um, and so I can see someone saying like, well, you like dinosaurs. We should have brought dinosaurs more front and center in the game. If it's going to be about dinosaurs, make it about dinosaurs. Now there's dinosaurs everywhere. 
Um, but you know, as soon as you do that, it takes some of the strangeness away. It takes some of the special specialness away. Um, and you know, maybe it's better to keep them, you know, on the side as a background monster, uh, to add spice once in a while. Hmm. Honestly, like a, you know, that, like it's a, funny because, yeah, go ahead. Sounds like a similar count, a similar argument to the counter argument to the expansion of uh, fantasy races in D and D, right? Uh, like mm-hmm. by 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 making yes. them more common and more playable, and anybody can be anything. And now we live in these cities where there's just a mix of like all these different, like fifty different playable races. That like the, the sum of the specialness goes away, right? I agree. Mm-hmm. That's a great. That's a great example. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, it's a con- it's a common problem, right? It's it's the con- continual you know problem of of a fantasy campaign or setting or story of like you bring something mysterious in and you look at it more carefully and now it's not mysterious anymore, which was the interesting thing about it. Um, so um, yeah, it's funny because that's the one case. Like if you're gonna make dinosaurs like domesticated, that for some reason my heart flips and now I actually do want some different name for them actually. So, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, part of the, part of the subtext for Isle of Dread is maybe there's a Lord that told you to go capture a dinosaur and bring it back. And I'm thinking, well, what are they going to do with it? Maybe, maybe that one particular species gets bred and used as a, as a, as a pack animal. And then they come up with some different name for it. Um, In the original Dark Tower game, there's a there's an element that's very important called the beast that allows you to you know break all your encumbrance limits basically and it kind of looks like this kind of weird kind of half triceratops half rhinoceros creature in my mind i'm like maybe someone bred a triceratops and that's your that's your beast of burden now and i kind i kind of like that as a one off special thing but i wouldn't want 25 different dinosaur species running around mhm mhm that's just me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. I don't know. It could be interesting, I suppose. Go on, go on. I don't know. It, it almost seems kind of boring that the end result is go and capture this dinosaur so that we can make it a beast of burden. Like, I want it to be, Maybe. like, uh, one of those ridiculous, like, well, we have this wyvern problem, so go and capture a dinosaur that will eat the wyverns, and now we have a dinosaur problem. So now go, <laughs> go and capture <laughs> something else. Well, uh, okay, so whoever it was a couple minutes ago asked, like, how do dragons feel about dinosaurs? Um, mm-hmm. And my, I mean, my, my personal initial stab was, would be that they feel great about them with a, with a, with a light lemon sauce. Um, so maybe, <laughs> maybe, the Lord, maybe the Lord initially has a pet dragon. I mean, you've had this problem in my game, Paul. The, the, the players, the, the, the Lord has a, has a pet dragon, but now he's got a problem of feeding it, right? So what we're well, going to do is we're going we're gonna to go get and spawn a whole zoo of brachiosaurs, right, which are like the rats <laughs> that we feed our pet dragon. Maybe that's what's happening. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get oh, loose, no. and now you've got invasive species. <laughs> yeah, yep. as our viewers are saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of good ideas there. Um, let me say this. Okay, so, you know, um, it is, and right now we're looking at artwork from uh, Isle of the Ape, actually, where in one of the, I think that, you know, honestly, that was the encounter that my players all per- uh, perished at, is what we're looking at on screen right now. So there's a, there's a magical temple um, and among the things that can happen is it just like throws tyrannosaurs at you. And uh, I think my I think my players got gobbled up slash driven insane by that horrible cursed temple that Gygax threw down there. So that was actually the the the, the ending scene for my campaign there. But in a lot of these places, you know, at least traditionally, Isle of Dread, uh, Isle of the Ape. The dinosaurs are basically just basically just wandering monsters. They're in, in no case are they the center of attention. Uh, there's something else you're trying to get to. They're in the wilderness wandering around, and they're not at no point are they really critical to the the plot or the or the game flow. So again, I can see why someone says we want to bring them more more front and center. But the thing is, I, what I found running Isle of the Ape is that you have a little bit of a gameplay problem. Is dinosaurs are huge and they're powerful. 
Okay, so Tyrannosaur, we're looking at 20 hit dice and four, four dice or more of damage. And a Brontosaur is, you know, they made that like 30 hit dice or something like that. So it's, they're big. They've got to be outside probably. They have an enormous amount of hit dice. They do an enormous amount of damage, but they're limited in all kinds of other ways. The, the dinosaurs that we're mostly familiar with, they're landbound, right? Brontosaur, Tyrannosaur, unless you bring in a Pteranodon or something like that, they're all landbound. None of them have ranged attacks. None of them have any special abilities. None of them have any defense against magic. And so in the standard situation where you're trotting them out against high level D&D heroes, 10th level, 12th level, 15th level, your, your, your PCs have a lot of ways of just, you know, ending mm -hmm. the encounter with a dinosaur. They can turn invisible. They can just fly overhead. Maybe they've got a magic carpet. They can, you know, charm monster. There's a lot, if you've got a druid, They've got a lot of animal spells that probably work. You charm animal, invisibility animal, animal friendship, speak to animals, right? There's lots and lots of ways for a high-level party to very efficiently deal with, you know, dinosaurs aren't smart. Gygax hammers that over and over again. They have no brains at all. They're peanut-sized brains. They can't think at all. They can barely find food. Um, and so there's kind of this disconnect of you throw some you throw a whole bunch of dinosaurs at your high level PCs and then one round later they're just it's just over. Mm -hmm. So I think that 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 again argues for not spending thirty or forty pages of dinosaur stats. Just give a couple ranges, give a little bit of flavor, and maybe that's probably what dinosaurs are going to be doing in your game most of the time. Why I guess why the assumption that they are. Uh, something to be thrown at high level PCs. Well, if I throw a twenty hit die Tyrannosaur at uh, at lower level, they can't deal with the you know they can't deal with the hit dice and they can't deal with the damage. Um, maybe there's some kind of balance point, but I feel it's going to be it's going to be a uh, uh, an unsettled. It's gonna it's gonna be a dangerous point where the switchover is where you can deal with it and where you can't. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's yeah, you're probably right, right? Like that's um like I guess I was thinking like sort of low mid low mid level, right? Where maybe maybe the players have a fireball, which is still not gonna kill the thing. Right. So right. um right. yeah, and so then really you're kind of challenging all right, all right, players, now you you know, you can take out whole swaths of Goblin camps, that's fine, but here's a here's a dinosaur. What are you going to do about that? And they got to they're going to have to do a little lateral thinking to deal with it because they're not just going to go out there and straight combat it. It's just not going to work. You know, now again, I'm thinking of the top level stuff, admittedly. So, um, yeah. uh, you know, John Thomas Kayser there in the comments there is saying, well, I mean, just Dan, just use a five hit die dinosaur. There's a bunch of stuff like that. Use a Velociraptor. Use a Utah Raptor. Something like that. Uh, legitimate. I, that is, admittedly wasn't the top of my mind. Uh, again, thinking of like Isle of Dread or Isle of the Ape, where you've got to fight across a very long wilderness to get in where you're going, you're probably going to need to be a little bit higher level for that. And then when the dinosaurs show up, they're not that big a threat, all things considered. I mean, the problem, again, is it's going to be, it's going to be very volatile, right? It's going to be either TPK or not a problem at all. The possibility yep. of dinosaurs being like a really interesting 50-50 fight is there's a very small little window for that to be possible. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Hmm. Yeah. Unlike some other stuff that's got some defenses and some special attacks and stuff like that, um, to make it interesting, it is kind of a brute. It is kind of a, a kind of, you know, they're all kind of like these brute encounters that you're either okay about or you're very much not okay about. And then and finally, course, you know, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that the, the place my head keeps going is I really want to see uh, a scenario that basically involves, um, you know, like some, some wizard finding this lost land, <laughs> nailing a Tyrannosaurus Rex with a Char Monster or something, and then riding it back into the normal lands. So, like, <laughs> you, know, you don't have to do the whole, like, land of the lost, whatever. You just take it that that exists. And what happens when somebody starts using that as a resource and is like, I'm just showing up on my Tyrannosaurus Rex and I'm going to smash the crap out of your castle. Here I come. <laughs> That's actually very good. 
<laughs> you should you should do what Paul just said. Everybody do what Paul just said because actually that's a very very good idea. I think that yeah. would be a fun and, adventure. <laughs> and maybe there's like a particular trading route. I mean, maybe there's like one sea route and like one land route, and the kingdoms are like battling over who has control over the route to get the dinosaurs. <laughs> Oh dear. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And your wizard when your wizard castle just like extend the, the, the charmed monsters to like now you've got dinosaurs too. I like that a lot. Excellent. Yeah, what if you what I mean what would happen if you used like a brachiosaur as a as a siege engine? Just reading yeah. Jerry's idea there. Yeah. What exactly would happen? Yeah, we're, we're definitely we're definitely edging in back into the uh, Flintstones territory, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. And, I'll, I, and i'll also say like some of us even go you know the you know animals in D D when they get really big and i've talked about this with our viewer william and i've talked about this with nathan recently of like you know, do, does the D&D &D system even work when animals get so huge that they may not even notice you anymore? Um, you know, maybe the whole hit dice AC attacks thing starts to break down when you're dealing with a Brachiosaur or Tyrannosaurus or a sperm whale, right? And maybe, hmm. maybe, maybe you should turn those things into like environmental hazards and treat them in a completely different way. Than the standard hit dice hit dice element because because if you know if i do math or whatever and i try to find some kind of system inevitably at the upper end it's like wildly broken if i try to extend it out to whales or something like that um admittedly i try to i try to like make the system work for me i have a system that usually works so i try to stick with it but you might consider just saying it's a totally we're, we're not going to give brontosaurus hit dice just just get out of the way <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's interesting. <laughs> that could be. Um, all right, then we are we are close to time here. Um, any, any final thoughts on dinosaurs? Well, I you know I I'm a big dinosaur fan, and who <laughs> and and probably a lot of people uh, share that sentiment. So I was you know so excited uh, you know to see it. They were in D and D, and I absolutely wanted to run isle of dread and i absolutely wanted to run isle of the ape and you know these adventures that did feature them having done that then yeah i discovered like a lot of animals that there are some um uh, there, there are some weirdnesses in the way that you try to make an encounter for for player characters player characters of all these magic resources and dinosaurs have none of that um so you might want to keep that in keep that in mind um, having a lost world setting is great. Um, and you know, of, and there's no need, there's no need to list 50 or 60 different types. Once again, original D and D had a really great idea. Um, you can just, you can just scope out, you know, general ideas for what, uh, Tyrannosaur types look like and what Brontosaur types look like. And you're going to get a lot of mileage. You're going to get a lot of mileage in your mm -hmm. campaign setting for that. And the players will probably be really, really happy and excited and terrified uh, to see that. So that's that gets you that gets you a lot of mileage. Hmm. I would I would still even gosh, I feel like most of the time when you want to include dinosaurs, um, that that it's it's. It, I don't know. Maybe you're maybe you're maybe like me. You're inventing this weird tree of life thing that your players are going to go find, and so you just need, um, yeah. So you just need a bunch of stats for for creatures to toss out there. I, I guess I'm curious, Dan, because I don't have it at hand. Um, but if I if I grab my copy of um, um, of X two X two it's X two right X one um, X one. Thank you. Number one, baby. Uh, yeah. Is it full of the stats, or is it expecting me to crack open my monster manual? So for uh, so you're talking Isle of Dread, the 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 expert adventure, yeah, yeah, right? That's one. Yeah. So you know, I I forgot, but they they do actually have half a dozen dinosaurs in the expert core rulebook. Um, oh, again, okay. the big ones, right? Right, right, right. Totally, I totally forgot about that. 
Um, so they're basically leaning the, on the fact that you have that, and then they add another four or five. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. That I, tends I, I would to be the, your, your content that introduces the idea of a lost land is going to include custom stats for the things you're mm -hmm. going to find there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so probably you don't need a bazillion stats for a bazillion different kinds of dinosaurs because, uh, you know, unless you're, you're inventing from whole cloth, which maybe you are. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and then, and then whatever, I, I feel like you can probably interpret, so you don't need a bazillion types of dinosaurs. Uh, dinosaurs are really interesting. I think that, uh, I think though, th my major takeaway with them is that they need to be used sparingly. Um, but they're, they're, the key enjoyment of dinosaurs is how strange and unusual they are, which you can only, which only exists if they're not, you know, around all the time. Yeah. Yeah, keep them special, right? Keep them special, yeah. I would say. I, I guess I, I'm going to regret I'm going to regret it if I don't throw out one last thing is don't forget that, you know, um, dinosaur knowledge advances very rapidly, right? Uh, you can see, you know, some really great videos on YouTube. I have a link to one of them in the description to this right now of uh, expert paleontologists watching movies like Jurassic Park or King Kong or things like that and commenting on even if they were doing as well as they could 20 years ago, now we already have a different understanding about a lot of the details of dinosaurs. Um, and so you might want to think about like, you know, when I describe them for my players, am I describing them like they're used to seeing in a movie or am I describing them like actual current scientific knowledge? Don't forget mm -hmm. that to our knowledge, like most dinosaurs had some kind of feather like structures um, on their bodies nowadays, some kind of maybe proto feathers, particularly the Tyrannosaur family, we have hard evidence that they actually had, you know, ancient feather structures on a Tyrannosaur. They weren't just like alligator leathery skin. Um, and, you know, maybe that's going to freak out your players. For me, I've said it before, uh, when I was very, very young, three or four or five years old, my grandfather had this friggin' goose, this goose that defended his household like a dog. And every time I would go there, I would have this goose coming up from, you know, above me to attack me that I'd have to run away from. So I understand what it's like to get attacked by a Tyrannosaurus and that stupid goose. <laughs> so, if you'll, you know, go, you, go YouTube an attacking goose and just describe your Tyrannosaurus like that, because that's basically what it's like. That's basically what they were like. <laughs> Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Mother Nature, for be, for, for for keeping them around. Because because now we know. So describe them like that, or or not. It's up to you. You're the DM. It's D and D. Viewers, if you have options. ideas uh, of ways to incorporate your dinosaurs into your campaign, uh, things we haven't covered, uh, clever ideas, uh, YouTube videos of goose attacks. Uh, go ahead, go ahead and post those in the comments here of our YouTube video. Um, we would love to hear from you. Maybe that will spawn, uh, you know, a return to the land of the lost, uh, uh, episode of Wandering DMs. Yeah, definitely. Maybe we should talk about like Mars or the Ice Age, uh, the, the other optional tables, uh, that, uh, Guy Gex had in original D&D there actually. And, uh, of course, remember that you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, The Wandering DMs. And we're on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and GitHub and TikTok. And we have the, one, the handle Wandering DMs on all of those sites. So, so look for us there and you'll get updates. If you prefer to listen to our uh, show in audio-only podcast format, you can get those podcasts at our website at wanderingdms.com or through other podcast carriers like Google Podcasts, iTunes, and Spotify. If you were listening to this show right now on one of those third-party carriers, please take a moment to rate and review our show on that site. That helps other users of that site find us, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, we really do. And as usual, big thanks to our patrons who support the Wandering DM show. If you'd like to join them, please visit patreon.com slash wandering DMs. You see a couple different tiers, discounts on merch, monthly behind-the-scenes stuff we try to do. Uh, and access to our Discord server where we have after-party chat every Sunday, and we'll be there in about 10 minutes. So if you are a patron, uh, we hope that we'll see you there to um, get more of your ideas and continue the conversation there. Um, and one of the favorite things that we do every week. And uh, if you're not, uh, join, and we'd like to see you uh, by live video chat on the Discord server. And we're both, we're both there today, right, Paul? Yep, yep, I'll be there. I uh, hope to see you there, Dan. And, great. Yep, uh, definitely. Hope, hope to see some of our viewers there too. It should be an interesting conversation, I'm sure. 
<laughs> Definitely. Uh, other stuff uh, we got coming up. I will be on uh, late night Thursday again as I'm working my way through uh, the AD and D Pool of Radiance game. Now, now it, Paul is uh, kind of taunting me because he sent me an email the other day proving that he just beat Pool of Radiance like in like a week or two or something <laughs> like that. So, so thanks for sticking it to me, Paul, as I'm struggling <laughs> through it as a first time player. <laughs> Anyway, very Paul's a better player of Radiance player than I am. Yet again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so please, viewers, join if you can join in live Thursday late night, because I need I need I need help every night. And with your help, I'm getting a little bit better. So uh so 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 join me Thursday at eleven. Uh and of course uh we are uh live every Sunday. Um we'll see uh we have we have some stuff coming up in the summer, so our schedule might uh, possibly have a couple gaps in it, but we do hope that you'll join us every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So please join us again next time for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.